from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now tonight, I want you to turn with me to the third chapter of Daniel. Now at this time, Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon, and he was the greatest of all the kings probably that ever lived. And he conquered Jerusalem, and he takes some Jewish captives among the young men, many of them in their middle or late teens. They were scientifically inclined. He takes them back to Babylon to train them to help him as he builds his empire very much like the Soviets and the Americans after World War II. They took German scientists. I remember one of them was Werner von Braun, who made a great contribution to the American military power. And I remember sitting with uh, Werner von Braun not long before he died. We were at a banquet in Los Angeles at the Century Plaza Hotel. And my wife and I happened to be at the table with him, and we'd known him quite a long time. And he told us how, intellectually, he had come to believe in Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, not just by faith alone, but he became convinced that there was a God, and that drove him to study the Bible and the New Testament, and he came to know Christ as his Savior. Now, among the captives of Nebuchadnezzar, there were a number of top young Jewish men. Four of them are named in this passage, Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. And they were disciplined in all the ways of the Babylonians so that they could help as Nebuchadnezzar extended his empire to become the greatest empire in the world at that time. Now Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego knew assertive discipline early because as we've already heard in the scripture that was read to us by John Wesley White, they refused to eat of the king's meat and drink of the king's wine because the king's meat had been offered to idols and they knew it was against the law of their God. Now, they were 1,500 miles from home. Who would know? Who would care? But they knew God was watching. And as young men, they dedicated themselves and they committed themselves totally to God. Now, Daniel had had a dream. And uh, he called in the astrologers and the soothsayers and the scientists and all the other people. And he said, tell me what the dream is. Nebuchadnezzar had, had the dream. And they said, well, tell us the dream. He said, I can't tell you the dream. I can't remember it, but it troubles me. Tell it to me. If you don't tell it to me, he said, I'm going to have you hacked to pieces. Well, boy, that really made them study and work and try to come up with the answer. But they said, we can't tell it to you unless you tell us the dream. We can't interpret it. And so Daniel called one of the guards over to him and he said, I can interpret the dream. God has revealed it to me. My God has. And he went to see Nebuchadnezzar and he said, don't kill all the astrologers and the soothsayers and the wise men of Babylon. I'll tell you the dream and I'll interpret it. He said, what you dreamed was the dream of a great statue. And it had a gold head and its breast and its arms were made of silver and its thighs and stomach were made of brass. It had legs of iron and it had feet of clay mixed with iron or iron mixed with clay. And Nebuchadnezzar said, that's right, God has revealed it to you. Now, what is the interpretation? And so Daniel interpreted and said, you, sir, are the head of gold. You are the greatest empire, the greatest king that will ever live. And then it will decrease on down till the end of history. And then will come the stone cut out without hands and will crush the image and it will come tottering down. In other words, Daniel was being told by God, that all the empires of the world will someday fail and only the kingdom of God is going to survive. And that was that, but that's the second chapter. Now we come to the third chapter. There's another image. Nebuchadnezzar has become very powerful, very egotistical, as men of power often get. And so he decides he'll build a statue to himself, a big image, 99 feet high made of gold, and he calls thousands of his subjects from many of the countries of the Middle East to come on the plain of Dura. And there he says, I want, when you hear the trumpet sound and you hear the music play and you see the flags coming in and you see the marching of the soldiers, I want all of you to bow down and worship the image. And if you don't, I'm going to throw you into flames of fire and you'll be burned up. 
You see, false, false religion does not hesitate to use force. The Bible teaches that Satan is the god of this world. He's the prince and power of the air. He's the prince of this world. And he uses force to get people to believe strange things. And we're seeing force used by religious groups today all over the world as tensions are mounting on a scale so rapid that we cannot keep up with them. And we've seen even in the past few days things happening that we never dreamed would happen. But they are happening. And it seems that the world is rushing madly toward World War III, and World War III will be Armageddon. The four horsemen of the apocalypse are already riding. I can hear their hoofbeats. And unless we repent and turn to God, they're going to come with all of their war and their destruction and the starvation and the diseases and the death and the hell that they bring with them. He commands that they worship the image. But Christ also was asked to worship at the image. He was asked to bow down and worship the devil in Matthew 4. But Jesus didn't argue. He didn't debate. He said, it is written. All he did was to use the Word of God. That's the reason it's important to memorize passages in the Bible, because he just used it as a weapon. And he said, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. God had said in the very first commandment of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Jesus said in Matthew 6, no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and materialism at the same time. You have to choose. That's a choice that every person in this room will have to make. It's a choice that every person watching by television will have to make. It is a choice that every one of us has to make between bowing down to the things of this world that are evil and wrong and bowing down before the true and the living God. And the images that Satan calls upon young people to bow down to today, pride, lust, many other things. Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego restrained their desires in situations of temptation. And they said, no, we will not bow down to the image. Now, Nebuchadnezzar could destroy the body, but not the soul. And Jesus warned about those who could destroy the body and the soul. In Matthew 10, he said, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. You have a body, but living inside of you is your soul, your spirit. That's the part of you that will live forever the part of you that remembers and the part of you that feels, the part of you that's the real you, will live forever. And Jesus said, fear the one that can destroy both body and soul. That's the devil. Because hell was created not for you, but for the devil and his angels. And if you persist in bowing to the images of this world and rejecting the true and the living God in your life, then you are going to follow the devil to hell. Now, to disobey God's commands is called spiritual and eternal death. Now, these three Hebrews did not bow down. They stood up. They were the only ones of the thousands that were there from the different languages and the nations and the ethnic backgrounds of the whole world of that day that came to bow before the image of Nebuchadnezzar. They stood stiff like this as ramrods. They wouldn't bow. And, of course, it was reported immediately to the emperor now, the alternates before them, they could have taken an alternate route. First, they could have bowed and avoid trouble. It would have compromised all that they believed in. They could have rationalized and said, it's our duty to obey the king. And that's our first duty. But they had a higher law. They had the Ten Commandments. They had God. And secondly, they could have said, it's just a matter of form. After all, religion is a matter of the heart. God knows that inwardly we're true to him, even though outwardly we'll bow down to the image. 
or they could have stayed indoors that day. That would have been cowardly. They had an opportunity to witness to thousands that day, and they took an opportunity to do it. Jesus said, He that loveth father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. The Bible says, If sinners entice thee, consent not. Follow not the multitude to do evil. Then they could have said, We're far from home. God doesn't expect us to live like we did in Jerusalem. Who'll know? Who'll see us? Or they could have said that they were under obligation to the king, and they were. He'd been very good to them. Or they could have refused to bow, which they did. They refused to bow. Choose you this day whom you will serve, says the Scripture. Who are you going to serve? The true and the living God? Or are you going to serve these things that the devil brings in your path? The images that he places for you to bow to, for you to give in to. Decision could not be put off. They had to make a decision. Then, when the heralds announced it, when the announcement was made, they had to make a decision. Just like some of you will have to make a decision tonight. You can't put it off. He that hardened his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off, and that without remedy. God says, My spirit will not always strive with man. There comes a point beyond which you can go in which it is very difficult to return. And tonight, for many of you, this is the decision night. It's either yes or no. You say, well, it may be maybe. Some of you will try to straddle the fence and live in both worlds, but God doesn't allow that. Jesus will not compromise with you. He will not make it easier for you. He will not lower his standards. If he had lowered his standards, he wouldn't have gone to the cross. But he went to the cross and he died and he shed his blood for our sins. He rose again from the dead. He's coming back to rule this world someday. The gospel plan is all set. And God says you have to repent. You have to receive him by faith. You have to accept my son into your heart as Lord and Savior and let him rule your life if you're to enter my kingdom. Yes, they refuse to bow to the devil and give in to the devil. What if it does cost you a few pleasures in order to save your soul? Would it not be better to be thrown into the fiery furnace here than to have both body and soul cast into hell forever? And when your trial comes, and it will, if you're a true, born-again Christian, if you're following Christ, you're going to be tried and tempted and shaken as you've never been before. When it comes, act in the light of eternity. Do not judge the situation by the king's threat or by the heat of the burning fiery furnace, but by the everlasting God and the eternal life which awaits you. Don't let the music of this world fascinate you. Don't let the drum beats cause you to march to the drum beats of this world. March to another drumbeat that the world cannot hear, the drumbeat from heaven. March by the steps ordered by the Holy Spirit and set by the example of Jesus Christ. And if you want to make that commitment, you that are watching television, you'll see a tele uh, telephone number there. Pick up your phone and call that number. Somebody is there waiting to talk to you, to help you, to make that commitment and that decision right now. Some of you are feeling the pressures. Some of you are going through trials and tribulations and temptations which are too great for you and you need help, you need prayer, there's someone there that will pray for you. And if you dial and it's busy, call back several times. They'll be there all evening. These brave young men dared the rage of the infuriated tyrant. And because they saw him who is invisible and had respect unto the recompense of the reward, they believed. But the king gave them another chance. Now, after this life is over, the Bible does not promise that you'll have another chance. No place in the Bible do I find where you're going to have a second chance. The moment you die, that's it. But the king gave them another chance. He gave them another opportunity. And they answered, tremendous answer. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, they said, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so that our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, then he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which you have set up. 
They didn't know that God would ever deliver them. They did not cringe and say, we beseech thee, please, Nebuchadnezzar, don't throw us in. Your majesty, don't. Think it over, sir. We can't disobey God, but we don't want to disobey you either. And they did not say, let's have a consultation and come to terms. And they went into this terrible furnace, and the men that threw them in were burned up. That's how hot it was. They said to God, thy will be done. And God says, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. It was only after their decision, they made a decision, after they made their decision, it was then that God intervened and delivered. He says, lo, I'm with you always. And when you have troubles and difficulties, he says, my grace is sufficient for you. And then the king looked into the furnace, standing back as far as he could so he wouldn't be burned up. He looked in and he was astonished at what he saw. What did he see? He said, I see four men, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Three men had been thrown in. They should have been nothing but a crisp. They were bound. But he sees four men, and the fourth one is like unto the Son of God. God had either sent his angel there, or it was the Son of God himself that had come. God is with his people in the fiery furnace. He is with his people in times of temptation and trouble and trial. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God, says the Scriptures. They have no hurt. The Lord shall preserve thee. He shall preserve thy soul. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? The way they walked into the fiery furnace, calm, self-possessed, joyful. Christ was with them. God was with them. Their bonds came off. And when the king ordered them taken out, they came walking out straight as a ramrod with their head high. Not even a hair of their head was singed. Their clothes, they'd gone in fully dressed. Their clothes didn't even have the smell of smoke on them. And the king bowed down before them, and he said, Your God is the true and the living God. And he ordered all the wise men and the soothsayers and the Chaldeans thrown into that furnace, and then he ordered that great crowd from all over the world to bow down to the true and the living God, and he destroyed the image that he'd built. And it changed Babylon because three young men dared stand alone, dared to die, dared to look death in the face and say, I believe. That's what Jesus Christ did. He stood before the cross. The cross was to be the next day. And that night on Gethsemane, he knelt down with his disciples and he prayed all night. And he sweat drops of blood. And he said, Lord, to his father, my father, not my will, but thine be done. If there's no other way to save the human race, if there's no other way to save Bill and Jim and Susie and Mary down yonder in 1983, I'll go to the cross. They deserve death. They've broken the law. They deserve judgment, and they deserve hell. But if you want me to, and if it's your will, I'll go and take their hell and their judgment in their place. So he stepped out the next day. They put a crown of thorns on him. Here he was, the Son of God, with 72,000 angels with drawn swords ready to come and deliver him and sweep this whole planet out of existence. He said, no, I love them. And then he took that cross on his back and staggered after they'd beaten him and his back was bleeding and they'd pulled his beard and his face was bleeding and they led him up Golgotha's Mount and there they put a spike in each hand and a spike through his feet and a spear in his side and he hung on the cross naked in front of a mass of people shouting, screaming at him. And he stayed there for you and for me.
He took it all alone on that cross for you so that you could have everlasting life. He took the furnace of hell for you so that you might be forgiven of your sins and when you die, go to heaven and have peace and joy here and now and have Christ with you through the Holy Spirit now, every day. You don't have to live one minute alone. Every problem, every difficulty that you face, He's there. He helps you in deciding who you're going to marry or what your vocation is going to be or what your life is going to be or help you in your studies or help you in your relationships with other people. He's there to help lift your burdens here and now. That's besides the life to come. He gives both life here and now and life to come, and it's all yours if you put your faith and confidence in Him. You say, well, what do I have to do? Three things. First, repent of your sins. How many of you here tonight could tell me what repentance is? You think you really know Christ, don't you? You go to church. You've been baptized. You've been to Sunday school. But you probably don't even know what repentance is. Repentance means change, the change of your mind, the change of your way of living. If when you came to Christ, your life didn't change dramatically over a period of time, then there's something wrong with that decision. If you have a doubt in your heart or mind that you're ready to meet God right now, you better settle it tonight and recommit your life to Christ and say, Lord, I need you. I was the leader of the young people in my church, but I really didn't know Christ in a personal way. And one night I found him. He found me and changed my life completely, and it was a totally different Billy Graham than the one that just went to church and led young people and told the elders of the church that I believed all the catechism and believed all those things. I did believe them with my head, but not my heart. My will had not been surrendered to the will of Christ. And then the second thing is by faith you receive him. The word faith means commitment. We've heard that word tonight, commitment. That means you totally surrender for the rest of your life to Jesus Christ, not only as Savior, but as Lord. You surrender your personal life, your body, your mind, everything to him. And then thirdly, you're willing to obey him and follow him and serve him. Three things, repent, believe, and the word believe is where we stumble because we do believe with our minds, but I'm talking about believing with everything you have, surrendering it all to him, and then obeying him, whatever the cost. The world or the furnace, which will it be? Because there is a judgment to come. And if you'll make that decision tonight, I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat. We've seen several hundred every night do what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of the platform and say by coming symbolically, I do repent of sin. I do receive Christ as best I know how. I will follow him with his help. I'm going to ask you to come and stand here, and after you've come, I'm going to say a word to you, have a prayer with you, and uh, we'll give you some literature to help you in your Christian life. It's a lifetime commitment to Jesus Christ. Quickly, you come. We're going to wait. As you can see, these hundreds responding here, we want you to take time to call that number now on your screen. Counselors are standing by, ready to talk with you. If the line is busy, just wait a few moments and then call again. Counselors will be there as long as the calls keep coming in. You that have been watching by television can see that many people here in Oklahoma City are coming to make their commitment to Christ. 
you can make that commitment where you are. Pick up the telephone and call the number on your screen. And if you don't reach someone, keep dialing. They'll answer after a while. May God bless you and help you as you make this commitment. And be sure and go to church next Sunday. Time of decision is really the most important part of every crusade service. And it's the most important part of this telecast because right now where you are, you can make your commitment to Jesus Christ. Take time to make that telephone call or to write Billy Graham. And the same helps we are giving these tonight who are responding here, we will send to you. If you just prayed that prayer with my father or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. we still have a window of opportunity to reach a lost and dying world with the truth of God's love. It's not too late. We've got an opportunity to tell others about Jesus Christ. What are you gonna do with it? From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now I want to take as our text tonight a passage in the 12th chapter of Hebrews. These words. And this word yet once more signified the removing of all those things that are shaken as of things that are made but those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Since we were here in the 50s and then in the 60s, things have changed. I was asking Joe Ulrich a moment ago, I said, don't you all still have street cars? It seems to me I've seen one since I've been here. And he said, yes, they've just put them in. And uh, I thought, well, that's the first city I've been to in a long time where they had street cars. The last I can remember was in Bucharest. They had street cars. And it took me back to my boyhood and childhood when we had street cars in our town of Charlotte, North Carolina. But many things have changed since we were here. And those of us that are senior citizens can really see a change in Portland. Things that you younger people take for granted. We were born before television, before frozen foods, before antibiotics, before nylons, before Xerox, before credit cards, 
For us, time sharing meant togetherness, not computers. And software wasn't even a word. We were before pantyhose and drip dry clothes, before ice makers and dishwashers, Cheerios, instant coffee, decaffeinated anything, and, Mac and McDonald's had never been heard of. And I don't know how we lived. If we'd been asked to explain CIA, VCR, UFO, ERA, NFL, or JFK, we, we would have said, well, that's alphabet soup. <laughs> when you think of how our world has changed and the adjustments we've had to make, today's senior citizens are a pretty hardy bunch because we came along through all of that. There have been great political changes. Hungary. We win the People's Stadium in Hungary about three or four years ago, and it had the largest crowd in its history to hear the gospel. 115,000 people in one service. South Africa would have never thought of having an integrated service in those days. We went to South Africa. We did not go until they guaranteed we could have integration. And we went there. And we can show you on film where the newspapers had headlines saying, Billy Graham says apartheid is sin. And uh, then there have been gigantic geophysical and ecological calamities across the world. I read last Sunday's Earth Week column in the Argonian, a diary of some of the things that happened on the planet last week. It talked of tropical storms last week, like the worst hurricane to slam into Hawaii in this century. It continued to report on the damage from Hurricane Andrew in Florida. Norman Mitski's house, who is on our team, uh, looked like some giant hand had come down and just lifted the whole thing up and lifted everything out. We went to Homestead in southern Florida, and my son, who's here tonight, Franklin Graham, has an organization called Samaritan's Purse, and they had already gotten 10 trailers in place down there by the time we got there to see it. And what a devastation that was. You cannot imagine what happened in southern Florida. You can't see it on television. Stefan Nelson, my grandson, spent his full time down there working, handing out water and bread and uh, things. And he saw on top of one roof this sentence that somebody had written. Okay, God, you got our attention. Now what? And the newspaper went on to mention Typhoon Sybil, the tropical storms, Payne and Roseland. Monsoon floods washed away entire villages in North India and Pakistan, killing thousands of people. There were earthquakes in Zaire and Nicaragua and minor shakes in many other parts of the world. These are just the things that came out of one newspaper. This is all in addition to environmental changes such as the sudden drop in levels of protective ozone over the Antarctic mentioned in the column that might signal major damage. I could go on and on. And that was just in your newspaper last week. We are living in a changing and increasingly dangerous world. That's the point I'm trying to make. It's not getting better. Do you have a purpose in your life and does life have meaning to you? Or is your life cracking up and going all to pieces? The big question today is, what is meaning? Fifty years ago when I started preaching, the philosophical question was, what is truth? Today's question is, what is the point? The Bible says the heart is deceitful, above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Your heart, my heart, is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who would believe that after a storm hit Miami 
and Southern Florida like Andrew, that there'd be looters taking advantage of it. I read an article in the Charlotte Observer last week that domestic violence cases are soaring after the hurricane in Southern Florida. We don't know our hearts. We don't know what would happen till it actually happens. Andrew Morris, the great philosopher in France, wrote, the universe is indifferent. Who created it? Why are we here on this puny mud heap spinning in infinite space? He said, I have not the slightest idea. And there are many people that take that attitude. Albert Camus, who was the great philosopher that everybody quoted a few years ago, said, man cannot live without meaning. Are you trying to live without meaning in your life? Now here are some of the things that the philosophers were saying that people think about when they're alone. When you're alone, here's what many people that are here tonight think about. First, you think about, well, I have to suffer. Maybe now or soon. I must struggle to make ends meet. I must struggle in my marriage. I must struggle with my girlfriend, my boyfriend, because it seems that things are going wrong. I must struggle to make grades in school. I'm at the mercy of chance. I feel guilty all the time, and I don't know what I'm guilty of. I ask the question when I'm alone, who am I? I know that I must die, and I'm afraid to die. I don't want to die, but I know I'm going to have to die. Every person in this audience 75 years from now will be dead. A scientist recently asked the question on television, who made the earth? Why is it here? What is its future? We have the answer. We just don't know. Then he said an interesting thing. Perhaps we're all going to have to restudy the biblical accounts. And that's exactly what many atheists are doing today. They're restudying the biblical accounts. The first time I met Mr. Yeltsin in the Kremlin, I talked with him, and he told me that he had been an atheist. But he said, I'm no longer an atheist. He said, I've come to believe that there's something beyond this life and something bigger than we are. And he said, I've started going back to church. And he said, my grandchildren are wearing crosses around their necks, and I'm glad. Now, that was a couple years ago before the coup. T.S. Eliot once wrote, where is the wisdom, think of it now, where is the wisdom that we've lost in knowledge? We have a tremendous amount of knowledge. We have universities by the scores and hundreds and thousands throughout the world. But we've lost wisdom in the midst of all of our knowledge. Jesus said, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity. In Luke 21, 25, distress. That word means that we're pressed from all sides. And perplexity means no way out. If you'd gone to Rio to that conference on ecology, and how can we save this planet? You would have come away like many of them came away, confused and mixed up, discouraged and hopeless. President Kennedy said a quarter of a century ago, no man entering upon this office could fail to be staggered upon learning the harsh enormities of the trials through which he must pass in the next few years. How right President Kennedy was. He went on to say, each day the crisis multiplies. Each day their solution grows more difficult. Each day we draw nearer the hour of maximum danger. And time is not our friend. 
In the midst of all these changes, there are certain things that have not changed and will never change. The first thing that has never changed in all these centuries, the nature of God has not changed. He said, I am the Lord, I change not. Malachi 3.6. The scripture says there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning with God. That means the batting of an eyelash. Not even that much change in God in all these centuries. He's from everlasting to everlasting. He had no beginning. He has no end. I don't understand that, but I accept it. He's the one thing that we can count on is God. He's unchanging in his holiness. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, which was and is, is and is to come. Revelation 4, 8. God is unchanging in judgment. It says the Lord shall judge the ends of the earth. God is unchanging in love. For God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God loves you. That's hard to believe. That's hard to take in. But God loves you. And if you were the only person in the whole world, God would love you. And we, he would have sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for you. God is love. That's one thing I want you to remember when we leave that we've said. And then the second thing, the word of God has not changed. Not only the nature of God has not changed, but the word of God has not changed. This Bible is the word of God. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. And what you read in this book stands forever. It's a thrilling thing to take up this book and know that you are reading something inspired by God and it's his message to the human race. He tells us where we came from. He tells us where we're going. He tells us how to live every day. The third thing that hasn't changed, human nature has not changed. Jeremiah the prophet said, as I said a moment ago, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You're a sinner, I'm a sinner. Sin means that I've broken God's laws. I've broken the Ten Commandments. If you have broken one commandment one time, you're guilty of all. Have you ever told a lie? Have you ever had lust in your heart? Then you're guilty. We're guilty before God. And because we're guilty, we're under sentence of death. Death in this life and death in the life to come. The way of salvation has not changed. In all these centuries, the way of salvation is still the same. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved in Acts 4.12. John 14.6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. In the last generation, the only way to God was through Christ. In this generation, the only way to God will be through Christ. The only one in history of whom it is written, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Think of it. The wrath of God abides on you now. And the only way that wrath can be turned away is by the cross. When Jesus Christ took your sins on the cross, God could no longer see your sins because your sins were buried in the depths of the sea. And God cannot even remember your sins. Think of it. God cannot even remember. He has the ability to turn the tape recorder off and erase it. And God cannot remember your sins when you come to Christ at the cross by faith and repentance. Yes, God will never change. The Word of God will never change. But you have to change if you were to go to heaven. If you were to have a, a new life here and have purpose and meaning in your life, you have to change. 
the first thing you have to do is repent. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out, the scripture says. The second thing is to believe, and that word believe means to commit. That's the marriage vow that we take. It's not just getting married, it's a lifetime commitment. My wife is here tonight, and she, uh, and uh, we've had differences, like every normal couple. And someone asked her, had she ever thought of divorce? She said, no, but I have thought of murder. I don't know where she's sitting, but sometime I'm going to ask her to explain that. But we have a wonderful marriage and we have a wonderful family and all of them know the Lord for which we give thanks to God. Now I want to ask you, do you know Christ? You see, Christ died for you. And on that cross, God laid on him the sins of us all. We deserved hell. We deserved judgment. We deserved to pay the price for our sins. But Jesus took them voluntarily on the cross. And on that cross, he had the capacity, because he was the God-man, to see you sitting here tonight. He looked ahead these thousands of years and he could see you, and he knew you, and he knew all about you, and he loved you, and he's willing to forgive you and give you purpose and meaning in your life and change your life. Your life has to change. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Have you come to Christ? Has there been a time when you received him as your Lord and your Savior and said, Lord, with your help, I want to follow you. I'm going to read the Bible and I'm going to pray and I'm going to be as faithful to you as I can. I can't live the Christian life alone. I'm a failure. Billy Graham cannot live the Christian life. I've tried. I can't do it. But with the help of the Word of God, and the help of the Holy Spirit, I can live the Christian life. But He lives it through me. He produces the fruit of the Spirit, which is love and joy and peace. All of these things are supernaturally produced in you by the Holy Spirit when you receive Christ. Some people say, I'm trying to hold on. You don't need to hold on. He holds you. Just turn loose and let him come into your heart. How many of us, we've been baptized? We go to church once in a while, maybe every Sunday. But deep in your heart, there's a doubt that you know Christ. You're not sure that if you died at this moment, you'd go to heaven. You want to be sure. You want to be certain. You want to know that your sins are forgiven, and you want to know that purpose and meaning that God can give to you. Are you willing to change your way of living? That's repentance, to change your mind, to change the direction of your life. And you can't repent by yourself. The Holy Spirit has to help you do that. And then you come by faith, and faith means commitment. When I stepped on this platform last night, I'd never been on this platform before. I didn't get down and examine it to see if it would hold me up. I accepted by faith that the carpenters that built it, built it to hold a man. And by faith, you receive Christ in the same way. You totally commit yourself. You say, Lord, I'm not trusting anything else to save my soul except Jesus. I commit myself to him. Young people today are looking for a cause. 
They're looking for a flag to follow. They're looking for something to really believe in. People are mixed up. They're confused. They don't know what to think. They're just angry. And many people think, can we hold together as a society? Come to Christ. He will meet all those longings and all those needs and give you a new life he can come into your family. He can come into that office where you've been having trouble. He can come into your schoolroom. He can come into every phase of your life and make you a new person. He can make those ends meet. He can help you meet those payments. He can help you in looking for a job. He can give you total assurance that your sins are gone and that God will never hold you accountable for them again. They're forgiven and he receives you with open arms and he'll do it tonight if you'll let him. And I'm going to ask you to do something we saw hundreds of people do last night. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of this platform and say by coming, I want Christ to come into my heart I want him to take all of me. I surrender my life to him and I say, Lord Jesus, I am willing to repent of my sins and turn by faith to you and put my total confidence and my total faith in you. He died on the cross and shed his blood for you. And certainly you can come and take a stand here for him. He said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me publicly before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. That's the reason I ask people to come forward. Every person Jesus called in the New Testament, he called publicly. Everyone, you look and see. There was one, Nicodemus came by night. But those that made their commitment to Christ came publicly. I'm going to ask you to come publicly and receive him as your Lord and your Savior and your Master. You come right now. We're going to wait on you. Just as hundreds here have responded to the invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can too, wherever you are. Just call the number on your screen right now. Special friends want to help you with this most important decision you can ever make. So don't wait. Call now. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. 
On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. It's Anne. She's in trouble. And if you don't take it to the edge every chance you get, you're dead already, baby. I was in trouble, and I didn't know what to do. Where are the juice? I knew that I could take on the world.